visits someone for dinner, and upon arrival, everything is ready. Notice the swept walkway and the fresh smell of flowers, vacuum treads in the carpet. The effort has been made, the preparations are complete, everything is ready. As guests, we arrive for dinner expecting nothing less from our host. Perhaps we even plan to arrive five minutes late to prevent the host's embarrassment over incomplete preparations. The host is ready. The Gospel records the place for the Passover has already been selected. The floors have been swept. Any sign of leavening has been removed. And it comes as a surprise. The meal is already planned. In the midst of palm processions and visits to the temple, confrontations with religious leaders, Jesus has found time to prepare the celebration of this holy Passover meal. He prepared it for those he loves, with those he knows who will fall away. And it is a surprise. You see, Jesus has mentored these 12 for so many years, and he prepares this Passover meal, a required pilgrimage for each of them to share in the feast while they're in Jerusalem. For us, it would be like hosting a dinner for the, for the rebellious child or the challenging in-law with a sense of obligation that it's the right thing to do. And Jesus prepares this meal knowing they will falter and fall away. Perhaps this dinner for those, he, he prepares this dinner for those he loves and it's a surprise. Perhaps the surprise has more to do with the fact that God is always prepared. And frail humanity struggles to meet the challenges that each day offers. Scripture says, the place is ready. The surprise runs deeper. We, with our 21st century eyes, we look at Scripture's words and we see the whole truth. We see Jesus as he calls out the temple authorities and sets priorities straight with, the occupy, with occupying Rome. Following Jesus implies that we will engage in the world. Now this past week as citizens went to the polls to vote, wonder how many of them stood up to the notion of principalities and powers or maybe held their faith high as the standard for election choice. Or perhaps we closed our eyes and said a prayer and picked the best of the worst. All silent, all private, we hold our opinions close. Not Jesus. He is nose to nose with others about issues that matter about issues that are life and death. And we watch as disciples falter in their allegiance to the way, and we hear their hollow promises that we know return empty. Perhaps a greater surprise about this meal is that Jesus is the host. Jesus spends a significant part of his ministry eating with tax collectors and sinners, with families and with friends and disciples. He is never the host. There are a few picnics along the way where thousands are miraculously fed by God's provision at Jesus' request. God is the host of that meal. Jesus is never the host. This is the only place in Scripture where Jesus is the host of a planned, formal, sit-down meal. And the meal is the meal that celebrates the liberation of God's people, the Passover, when the blood of the Lamb was painted on the door lentils, and the people of God, 
who were held captive in Egypt ate their meal on the run. They ate for liberation from oppression. This is the meal that was commemorated in the wilderness 40, for 40 years and continued to be celebrated throughout all of faith his, history. Even in this moment, the saving acts of God are recounted. And at this meal, Jesus is the host. And notice, nested between the declarations of disciples' betrayal, Jesus does this most amazing thing. He recalls the actions on that day beside a lake when 5,000 were fed. He took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to them. And they were satisfied. But then Jesus adds these words, take this is my body, and the cup is the blood of the covenant, the covenant that was made in the moment of God's salvation for the Israelites, a new cup. And there is another surprise. All the disciples ate and drank, all the disciples the one who was bound to an oath of betrayal with the high priests, he ate and drank. Peter, who denies Jesus three times, he eats and he drinks. The disciples who stood silent in the background ate and drank. And those who could not be found, they ate and they drank. Jesus gives this gift to disciples in the midst of betrayal. He bound them to himself despite their failings because Jesus claimed all these disciples as his own. He exerted his authority as the Son of Man to open other possibilities. And the disciples, by sharing that meal, bound themselves to him forever. So here we are, gathered this day, eager to break bread in Jesus' name, to the words, take, bless, break, and give, once again. As followers of Jesus, we don't need public confession to come clean about the times and places we have betrayed our Lord with thoughts and words and deeds, maybe just in this week. And we have every intention of living next week faithfully. And we're realists. And maybe this is our prayer, that God would take our lives again for they are truly his, and that God would bless us even more abundantly than we have already been blessed. And in that blessing, break within us those things that make us barriers to others' ability to hear the good news. And once we have been taken back to him, and blessed and broken. Let us pray that God will give us to the world that our lives might be poured out for many. Let us pray. Holy God, our lives are precious to you perhaps more precious than they are to ourselves. And so we ask, Lord, that you would take our lives and let them be an offering to you. In Jesus' name, amen.